Hi guys, welcome to this week's episode of Real World Basics. Today we're going to be covering Kitchen Basics. There is a foundational set of skills that all chefs use, whether they are cooking for a big restaurant, a family, or just themselves. Mastering a recipe is a really big accomplishment, and it's easy to get overwhelmed by the many different parts that make up a kitchen and all of the gadgets, terminology that exist out there. So this week's episode is going to help give you a foot in kitchen basics through the techniques, tips, and tricks that I've learned along the way. So hopefully when you guys are ready to start cooking for yourself, you've got a great foundation. So let's get started. So before we get into the how-to demonstrations of this video, I wanted to share some general tips and tricks that I've picked up along the way. Um, the first one would be never stop trying. You will probably have some disaster recipes and it's okay. Do your best to eat it. If you can't eat it or if it is inedible, do not feel bad if you have to throw it away. Um, I'm fortunate that I've had a super supportive family that has always eaten whatever I've made and I have fortunately continued cooking because of that and I've gotten better with each meal that I make. The three biggest tips I have for when you're first starting out in the kitchen is one, cook on a lower heat than you think you have to. I know you might be like super hungry and you're like, if I cook it on high, it'll cook faster. That will, is unfortunately not the case. It's going to burn the outside of your food and not really cook the inside. And worst case scenario, it's gonna create so much smoke that the fire detector is going to go off and then the fire department is going to be called and your entire apartment building has to be evacuated because you burnt a steak. Um, second, use a bigger uh, bowl, pot, or pan than you think you need because your food needs to breathe. When you're cooking on the stove, you wanna make sure that all of your food has an opportunity to touch the sides of the pan. That way it cooks thoroughly because if it's all just sitting on top of each other in a really small pot, it's not gonna get cooked all the way. And like if you're tossing a salad, you wanna make sure you have a big enough bowl because once you start tossing it, stuff will go everywhere. Similar with baking, if you're gonna use like a handheld mixer, you wanna have a bowl with tall enough sides so that way once the uh, it gets to blending, stuff doesn't go everywhere and you don't have a giant mess to clean up. And third is to clean as you go. If you um, clean as you go, even if it's just putting away the condiments when you're done with them or even uh, just stacking all of your dirty dishes in the sink, you will thank me, your roommates will thank me, your family will thank me. And uh, because once you're done eating, if you have had a successful meal, you are satisfied, you are full, you do not wanna get up and have to go clean up the giant mess you've made in the kitchen. Um, a couple of other tips is not to get overwhelmed by the endless amount of kitchen gadgets that exist out there. They're mostly single, like they have a single purpose and they can just take up more and more space in your kitchen. So if a recipe calls for a specific gadget, check and see if you already have a tool that might do the exact same job. You could have a handheld immersion blender, a full-size blender, a tiny little smoothie blender, and a food processor. Or you could just have one blender and it will do the same job as all of them. You don't have to go out and buy a veggie spiralizer for a meal. If you already have like a potato peeler, that would work just fine. And if you don't even have that, you have a knife and it will just cut everything into really small little pieces and it's essentially the exact same thing. So don't worry if you don't have the exact same uh, tool that the recipe is calling for, there's a lot of dupes and hacks out there that will give you the exact same result. So this is a fantastic recipe I have come up with for you guys to practice reading recipes. The most important thing when going through a recipe is to read it first. Um, it always helps to go through everything, have everything ready to go. So for this wonderful recipe, we would have one cup of this, a half cup of that, one pinch of something, and two tablespoons, whatever. So we read through these steps, and we see that the first one is to preheat the oven. Preheating the oven is actually super important, depending on the type of oven you have, how old it is, 
it'll make a significant difference in um, whatever it is you're putting in there if it's not actually preheated. Like my old oven took about 15 minutes to fully heat up and that 15 minutes um, makes a really big difference in whether or not something is fully done. So you would want to preheat your oven right away. And then as we go further through the recipe, we're gonna mix this, something, and whatever together. And then stir in melted that. Um, if we just went through the recipe one thing at a time, doing it as we went, we wouldn't realize that the, that needed to be melted. So having that already melted would save us a lot of time as we go through the recipe. And then pour it into the pan and bake it for one hour. Knowing how long it's gonna be baking is pretty important. Um, if you were doing this for a get together or something like that, you would know that you would need a full hour for this to bake, so you cannot get this thing in the oven right before you're supposed to be on, the, on your way over to your gathering. So knowing how long it's supposed to bake is really important, and how the ingredients all go together and how long it's supposed to be preheated are all great reasons to read your recipe ahead of time. So briefly touching on baking, um, when you are cooking, you can go a little freestyle. If you want things spicier, you can add more spice to it. If you're not really a fan of like the meat product they put in it, you can double up on the beans or something else and you can really add and subtract as fits your taste buds. But with baking, you cannot do that, otherwise it will mess up the entire recipe. Um, so the only exceptions I could think of would be like add-ins, like chocolate chips, nuts, dried fruit. You can really measure those with your heart, but everything else, all of the staple ingredients like your flour, eggs, butter, um, sugar, salt, all of that kind of stuff, follow the recipe as exactly as you can. There are some parts of baking recipes that are really time sensitive. So I really recommend having all of your ingredients pre-measured before you get started. Um, that way it saves you from like frantically trying to do something as, uh, as you're working your way through your recipe. The last tip I have for baking is to uh, measure by weight if you can versus measuring with measuring cups. Um, so if you have a food scale, you can measure everything in grams because again, the baking recipes are really sensitive um, to fluctuations in your ingredients, so it'll give you the most precise measurement that you can and ensures that your recipe turns out as great as it can. So I'm going to do a little measuring demonstration and give you some tips along the way. We're going to start by measuring solids. I'm going to first show you sugar and then I'll show you flour as there are a couple differences between the two. When measuring your solids, you take your measuring cup. I recommend getting an extra utensil to fill the cup with versus just scooping it in here because there are a couple of different um, substances that pack and it will affect your measuring. I also recommend putting either a placemat, paper towel, towel underneath your measuring. That way any overflow or spill can easily be poured right back into your container. So you can fill it up. Fill it up until it is overflowing. And then you take your knife using the flat edge, not the part that you would use to cut. That is what you use to level off. Once you're done leveling off, you have a full, perfect one cup measurement of sugar. That is what you would use to pour into your recipe. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pour everything back in. And now I'm going to show you measuring flour. 
So especially with measuring flour, you don't want to just scoop it or pack it up into your measuring cup as it drastically affects the quantity of flour. So when a recipe calls for one cup of flour, You take your flour and you sprinkle it into your measuring cup. There's supposed to be air in the flour that you're working with. It doesn't expect you to pack it down in there because that's going to change your recipe drastically. And similar to the sugar, you're going to fill it up till when it is overflowing. and then level it off with the flat edge of your knife. And again, you don't want to pack it down in there. You just want to make sure all of the little cracks have had a chance to be sprinkled with flour. And that is one full cup of flour for measuring. You can use these type of measuring cups to measure liquids, or alternatively, you can use one of these. So when using one of these type of measuring cups, you'll see that the measurements will be listed in a couple different places. In this one, it's listed on the inside and on the outside here. So you would pour your liquid into the cup and then you would look at it at eye level. As with science class, you wanna make sure you're looking at it with eye level as looking at it from a different angle could give you an incorrect measurement and therefore throw off your recipe. So there's a couple different types of measuring. However you do it, uh, just make sure it works best for you. You can certainly reuse measuring cups throughout ingredients. I always recommend working with dry ingredients first and then going over to the liquid ingredients. We'll go over some conversions for measuring cups. So let's go take a look at that. So this conversion chart is really helpful. It has cups, ounces, tablespoons, and teaspoons listed and their corresponding measurements. So this is great if you only have a couple of measuring utensils and you don't have everything that the recipe calls for but you still want to go ahead. Um, just requires a little bit of math on your part. But I found keeping a copy of something like this in your kitchen uh, very helpful for doing recipes on the fly. Um, do want to point out difference between tablespoon and teaspoon is just this letter B. Um, so it makes a huge difference when you're cooking. If you accidentally put in one tablespoon of salt versus one teaspoon of salt, so just be mindful of that going forward and you can always screenshot this and uh, print it out or we can upload a PDF for it for you guys to print out if you need it. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of cutting knives and the safety that goes along with them. There's a couple of different ones, but the ones you'll most commonly encounter are a small paring knife, this one is about four and a half inches. A bread knife. This one is going to have a serrated edge. And a larger chef knife. This one is about eight inches long. Also on a... Uh, a chop block like this one you might also find this this is kind of a large steel rod this is what you would use to sharpen your knives um, we'll go over that in just a little bit though so we'll come back but when you're working with a knife you don't want to cut on your countertop because all countertops are made of different materials and it could potentially damage your countertop or your knife so there's a couple of different types of cutting boards. You've got your standard plastic ones, which are great to work with. And then wooden cutting boards. Um, wooden cutting boards are great as well. 
Uh, they are not recommended for cutting meat, as raw meat on them, because they are porous and any bacteria that might be on your meat can hang around a little too long on a wooden cutting board. So if you're going to be cutting any meat, be it raw or cooked, I would recommend using a uh, plastic or glass cutting board. It's important to keep your knives sharp when you're working with them in the kitchen because a dull knife will injure you more if you accidentally cut yourself while you're working. So to sharpen a knife, you take it as well as your sharpening rod. And while pointing both away from you, you go along the uh, pointed edge back and forth. And it's a good idea to do this each time uh, you break out your knives to cook with them. There are electric knife sharpeners, which uh, do it a lot faster um, and with minimal effort on your part. However, not everybody has one of those in the kitchens, but most uh, knife kits will come with a steel sharpening rod. So now let's take a look at proper knife handling skills. When you hold it, you want to hold it gently but firmly in your hand. Um, some people will hold a pointer finger over the top of the knife. Um, it doesn't give you any more force behind the knife or control over it. It actually kind of creates an unstable balance on the uh, knife edge. So it's better to just have a nice loose but uh, secure grip on the handle. You always want to make sure you're cutting away from yourself and if a straight up and down chopping method doesn't work for you, you kind of want to do a rocking method like this while you're cutting um, to make sure you're cutting all the way through whatever it is. Now with your other hand that's going to be holding your object, you want to make sure you don't keep your little fingertips out splayed like this as when you're cutting it creates a whole loose little variable that's easy to get in the way of the knife. What you want to do is curl your fingertips over. You still have great control over the object that they're holding, but what it does is it takes away those loose little fingertips. And right here, it's just a flat edge, so there's nothing to get caught in the way of the knife while you're cutting. So we're going to talk a little bit about stovetop safety as in addition to working with sharp objects in the kitchen you're working with hot surfaces be it a burner top hot pots and pans hot liquids hot food so burns are also common and if you have an electric stovetop or gas stovetop there's also the possibility for fire so the first thing you can do to minimize your risks is to one never leave a burner that's on unattended so that is why it's important to make sure you have all of your ingredients out and ready to go. That way you don't have to run off to go get something. Um, and if you ever do, make sure you have somebody uh, in the kitchen to watch your burner and pot and pan for you while you're away. So another thing you can do to minimize any fire risks is to watch where you put your pot holders and any rags or cleaning supplies. So it's easy to use a pot holder to open up check on your food while you're working and then leave it there or leave it maybe on the burner next to it. And even if that's not on, it is still in close enough proximity to the uh, burner in use where it can catch on fire. So you always wanna make sure you put it on a surface far away from your burner in use. Um, same with uh, rags, cleaning supplies, or any wrappers you might be using um, from food you've thrown into your pot or pan and then you leave it, even if it's on the countertop, just right next to it over here, it's still in close proximity to the burner in use. So you just wanna make sure you're keeping anything flammable a safe distance away from the burner in use. The second thing we're going to go over is your pots and pans themselves. So it's pretty easy to leave the handle of your pot and pan sticking out off the burner as that's where it's easiest for your hand to reach. However, if somebody is walking through the kitchen, it's easy to get bumped because it's kind of in the abdomen area and then your pot can go tumbling off, somebody can get burnt and that's not safe. Also, if you have little ones in the house, they're very curious looking up at the stove, they might see this sticking out and try and reach up and grab it. And again, 
it can go tumbling off and then that's also very not safe. So the best thing you can do when you're working with your pots and pans at the stovetop is to take the handles and turn them over the stove and you've just negated all of those risks. The third thing we're going to go over is a stovetop fire, also known as a grease fire. So grease fires happen when you're cooking with oil on your stovetop and the oil reaches such a hot point that it just combusts into flame. You will uh, first notice the potential for a grease fire if you're cooking with oil and your oil starts to smoke. If you see that, the first thing you need to do is to turn off the burner, turn off the heat source, and to remove the pot from the burner. And you need to just let the oil cool down before you do anything else with that pot. Um, alternatively, if you do not notice the oil smoking in time and a fire does erupt, again, you need to turn off the heat source and cover the pot. When it runs out of oxygen, the fire will extinguish itself and it's honestly the safest way to handle a grease fire. Alternatively, you can use baking soda if you don't have a fire extinguisher. However, you need to make sure you read the labels on your fire extinguishers. They're all made of different chemicals and might not be appropriate for putting out a grease fire. A common misconception when dealing with grease fires is to put water on it, which is a terrible idea. Uh, liquids are fuel for grease fires and it will instantly take a small kitchen fire and crank it up to 100. Um, unfortunately, this is the first thing that pops into people's minds when they see fire. So if you've ever seen a video of a grease fire, when you, when they throw the water onto the burning pot or pan, it just pff, instantly ignites. At that point, you need to evacuate the house as quickly as possible, or if um, none of the other tips have worked when you're dealing with a stove top fire, evacuate and call 911. Thank you guys so much for joining me this week with Real World Basics. As always, if you guys have any suggestions or tutorials that you'd like to see, please don't hesitate to reach out to the library, either through social media or through email. And next week, I'm super excited because we are going to be going over basic recipe upgrades. These are tried and true recipes by yours truly um, on simple meals to use pre-existing ingredients that you already have to make a meal even better. See you guys next week. Bye.